Hey there, everyone. It's Mr. Lane here to bring you a lecture over chapter 21, the Renaissance in Quattro Cento, Italy. This is also referring to the 15th century Italian art, also known as the Florentine Renaissance. Key ideas include the revitalization of classical ideals, which is referring to the remains of Greco-Roman antiquity, like coins, gems, sculpture, buildings, and the classics of Greek and Latin literature. Humanism is popular. We have a secular over the religious being more prominent. There is a rise in realistic 3D painting. Human anatomy, there is an increase in nude sculptures. We have a political and economic changes. The wealthy patrons like the Medici family, who was a wealthy family that came to hold great power in Florence during the Renaissance. In regards to architecture, there's going to be lighter spaces, balance, and symmetry. Here's a list of the key terms. These are all the artworks we'll be analyzing. Because high level patronage required significant accumulated wealth, those individuals, whether princes or merchants, who had managed to prosper came to the fore in artistic circles. The best known Italian Renaissance art patrons were the Medici, the leading bankers of the Republic of Florence. Our first painting is Masaccio Tribute Money. Masaccio's figures recall Giotto's in their simple grandeur, but they convey a greater psychological and physical credibility. He modeled his figures with light coming from a source outside the picture. The body types can be described as classical, where you see a blend of realism with idealizing the human form. Notice that Adam and Eve's body types and poses are derivative of ancient Roman statuary. Compare Masaccio's Adam and Eve to John Van Eyck's Adam and Eve from the Ghent altarpiece on the left. Eve has the modest Venus pose from classical sculpture. In tribute money, painted shortly before his death, Masaccio depicted an episode from the Gospel of Matthew. As the tax collector confronts Jesus at the entrance to the Roman town of Capernaum, Jesus directs St. Peter to the shore of Lake Galilee. There, as Jesus foresaw, Peter finds the tribute coin in the mouth of a fish and returns to pay the tax. Masaccio created the figure's bulk through modeling, not with a flat, neutral light lacking an identifiable source, but with the light coming from a specific source outside the picture. The light comes from the right as if through a real window in the chapel wall and strikes the figures at an angle, illuminating the parts of the solids, obstructing its path and leaving the rest in shadow, producing the illusion of deep sculptural relief. Masaccio divided the story into three parts within the fresco. In the center of the fresco, scene one, we see Jesus surrounded by his disciples. He tells Peter to retrieve the coin from the fish. While the tax collector stands in the foreground, his back to spectators and hand extended, awaiting payment. On the far left, scene two, we see Peter kneeling down and retrieving the money from the mouth of a fish. And on the far right, scene three, St. Peter pays the tax collector. Christ performed a miracle, and the apostles have the money to pay the tax collector.
Charles Scroll is a strong contrast between light and dark. It's used to create a more realistic picture using a single light source. It also allows for modeling the human figure to give the figures more weight. Here's a close-up of the scene of Peter collecting the coin from the fish's mouth. Atmospheric perspective was used in the background where you see the clouds in the sky and mountains. It's used to create a deep illusion of space. Linear perspective was also used on this painting where you see Christ's head as the vanishing point. Linear perspective is another technique used to create the illusion of 3D space. Here we can see details like the muscles on the tax collector's legs and shadows cast by the other figures. Next we have Botticelli's Birth of Venus. Here's a link to an interesting video you can watch about the birth of Venus. Now for the story behind the birth of Venus. Zephyrus and Chloris, the personification of the west wind, the winged Greek god, Zephyrus brings movement to the scene. His cheeks are puffed out as he blows the waves that cast Venus towards the shore the island of Cyprus. He is classed by a semi-clad female, Chloris, a mortal nymph abducted by Zephyrus to be his bride. She was later transformed into the goddess Flora, the figure on the right, waiting to greet Venus. Two places and two people at once. Flora, the goddess of flowers, who also appears in Botticelli's Primavera, she represents spring, the time of rebirth. Around her neck, she wears leaves of the myrtle, a tree sacred to Venus. Her dress is springed with cornflowers, and she wears a high sash of roses. There are more spring flowers on the billowing pink cloak she holds out to Venus. The cornflowers on her dress in tense blue is created from ultramarine, an expensive pigment made from lapis lazuli, a semi-precious stone. Remember Induccio's Maestra altarpiece? The Virgin's mantle is painted in ultramarine. Since this was commissioned by the Medici family, no expense was spared. Venus is a fully grown woman. Her right hand covers her breast, while her left holds long skeins of golden hair over her pubic area. Her classical pose is known as the Venus Puduca, the modest Venus. Some artists portrayed the goddess as a more erotic figure. Botticelli's Venus represents the 15th century Italian ideal of female beauty. She has a small head and a naturally long neck steeply sloping shoulders, and a round stomach. Apart from the pink roses wafting down on her, Venus is pictured without her usual attributes, such as her pearl necklace or Cupid, her son. Despite the painting's title, the moment of her birth occurred under less poetic circumstances. According to Greek mythology, Venus emerged from the fertile foam that was created when her father Uranus severed genitals were thrown into the sea. Crazy, right? Now let's look at Andrea Mantegna's Dead Christ. Foreshortening was used to portray or show an object or view as closer than it is or as having less depth or distance as an effective perspective on the angle of vision. 
For example, here in the Lamentation, the chest and legs of Christ are shortened, creating a sense of space and depth. Scholars are not sure why this was painted. The iconography of the work, probably intended for the artist's private devotion, refers to the compositional scheme of the lamentation over the dead Christ, in which mourners are gathered around the body prepared for burial, laid out on a stone and already anointed with perfumes. Other figures in the painting include St. John the Evangelist, the Virgin Mary, and Mary Magdalene. Here's another detail from the painting. This sculpture of David was created by Donatello. One technique that was used is known as contraposto, which means weight shift. One of David's legs is slightly bent, which will cause a natural shift in his hips, as you can see here. Here's a question to contemplate. In the late medieval period, nudity was used to portray sinfulness, like in the expulsion from the Garden of Eden. What does David's nudity convey in this sculpture? Donatello's David was the first freestanding bronze cast statue of the Renaissance era, as well as the first nude sculpture of a male since the classical sculptures of ancient Greece. It was commissioned from the Medici family in the 1430s. Nudity in this case was used to portray a biblical hero rather than an allegory for sinfulness. There are also references to the classical, which refer to the nudity. He is referring to Greco-Roman sculpture for the position David is standing in, as well as their love for the body, as we mentioned the contrapostal earlier. The material is bronze, and the hollow using of last of the lost wax casting technique was also used with the ancient Romans and the Greeks. He is nude except for his boots and a hat topped with a laurel. Donatello borrowed from ancient Roman culture when including the laurel. It is a symbol of victory. His posture also can be viewed as a little bit erotic. His small frame and almost effeminate disposition imply that his victory is due to God's assistance. He holds a sword which looks huge in proportion to his body and smiles proudly. Some of the most popular and enduring stories involve an underdog who overcomes great obstacles and secures victory against the odds. Arguably the most famous of such stories is the unlikely triumph of David, the young Israelite shepherd, against the battle-hardened Philistine war machine, the 9'9 Goliath. David is standing on the head of Goliath, and the sword that Dave, in David's right hand belonged to Goliath, which he used to cut off his head. The subject of David represented the Florentine Republic, at least in the mind of the people. David in the biblical story defeats his enemy, even though he is the underdog with God's help. Like David, the Florentines had defeated their enemy, the Duke of Milan, in the early 15th century with the help of God. Our last painting is Fra Filippo Lippi. Madonna and Child with Angels. Fra Filippo was a monk, but was unsuited for that lifestyle. He indulged in misdemeanors, ranging from forgery and embezzlement, which is where you misappropriate the use of funds placed in one's trust 
belonging to one's employer. He also abducted a pretty nun, Lucretia, who became his mistress and the mother of his son, who was also a painter. Only the intervention of the Medici family on his behalf at the papal court preserved Fra Filippi from severe punishment and total disgrace. The Virgin sits in a prayer at a slight angle to the viewer. Her body casts a shadow on the window frame behind her. But the printer's primary interest was not in space, but in line, which unifies the composition and contributes to the precise and smooth delineation of forms. The Madonna is a beautiful young mother with a transparent halo in an elegantly furnished Florentine home. And neither she nor their Christ child, who two angels hold up, has a solemn expression. One of the angels, in fact, sports the mischievous grin of a boy refusing to behave during this occasion. Significantly, all the figures reflect the use of live models, perhaps Lucretia for the Madonna. The artist painted the charm of youth and beauty as he found it in this world. He preferred the real and the landscape also. The background you see through the window incorporates a recognized feature of the valley. Thanks everyone for watching. Here are some additional resources.